You born in Tennessee, huh? Yes. Really? Now, we've had a few people that have talked about uh, the Tennessee connection. There are a lot of folks that came up A lot of people in Borgwarn were from the South. Uh, we came up here in 1950. Uh, my dad worked on the uh, Texas pipeline. Came through Tennessee, uh, te from Texas to Tennessee, and then back up through towards the north. So we just moved north. You know, I, I've got one more thing I forgot to do. Do you mind uh, just saying and spelling your name for the camera, just to make sure we get it right on the transcript? Yep. My name is Don Hobbs. D O N H O B B S. And one last silly thing, if you don't mind, just saying hi. My name is Don Hobbs. Hi, my name's Don Hobbs. All right, we're talking about the Texas, this uh, Southern Pipeline. Uh, did you just call it a pipeline? It came from Texas up mm -hmm. there. And there were there were a lot of people. That's what your family did. That's what my dad did. Yeah. yeah. Just your dad uh, at that time would he would come up here and work or? No, he would. He was working in Tennessee at the time. That's where he met my mother at. Uh -huh. and they were married in Tennessee, and then uh, a few years later, we all. We moved up here because that's where the pipeline came. What did your uh, did your father work at Borgwarn? No. Did he, did he, what kind of job did he find up in Muncie at that? Was that the nineteen fifties? You said not the end of fifties. He uh, he stayed on the pipeline. So you just worked different jobs back and from the south up. I'm trying to understand. Well, a uh, pipeline may have went to Indiana, may have went on to Michigan or Ohio or, or wherever it went to. That's where he went. And then once there, he just found a job here. You're saying that you're saying that your family moved here at a yes. in the 1950s. Um, he traveled with the pipeline constantly. That was constantly, his job. Yeah, that was just his. Move people back and forth. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, but you guys, your home base became Muncie. Yes. In the 1950s. Yes, we went to school here. Uh, graduated from school, high school here. Got a job here. What do you remember of uh, Muncie uh, when you first? What's your first impression of Muncie that you remember? I liked it. I I came from a very small town. It was only uh, like fourteen hundred people lived in the town, and most all of us were uh, related to each other. Uh, so you knew everybody, so you couldn't do anything that everybody didn't know about. So when we got to we got to Muncie, I, there were different things to do, more things to do. With, was uh, was Borg Warner a part of any of these early memories? Were you aware of the factory or, or factories in Muncie? Uh, well, when I when I got old enough to uh, realize of uh, fact about factories, and they were factories on every corner. They were uh, just a huge amount of uh, of. Uh, of work and factories in uh, the city of Muncie. I mean, you could just, you could go into one plant one day and quit and then go to another the next day and get another job. You know, it's just, there was that many factories. And we're talking about 1960s here? 60s, well, I graduated in 1959. I started work in 1960 at Chevrolet Muncie. And then I decided, I worked there a year and uh, decided I'd like to see the country. So I quit and I had a, nice, a pretty nice car and, and a couple of us took off to California just to see the country. We worked along the way uh, at different jobs, odd jobs. Worked on a sheep ranch, cattle ranch, uh, picked fruit, picked potatoes in Idaho, and uh, sold ice cream in California. And then I came back to Muncie in 1961 and got married. Boy, you know, this this may be a little off topic, but I'm interested in this uh, this cross country trip. It was nice. It, it was probably one of the better experiences I had in my life. We, uh, of course, we ran out of money before we got to California, but when you're out of money, you just, you, you've got to get out and, and uh, find something to do. 
You know, you you might work for a guy just for gas money, or you might work for him for food. Or uh, this one gentleman in Arizona wanted us, wanted us to uh, work on his sheep ranch, but we had to stay back there for six months. You know, with the sheep during the winter months, and uh, couldn't stand that, so we let that one go by. How was uh? So you took a, what kind of car did you have? We had a 19 and 51 Chevrolet. Four guys in it? Fleetwood, yeah. Three, three of us. So one guy got to sleep. Yeah. (laughs) So when you moved back here in 1961 and you got married. Yes. You decided you needed a steady job, I'm assuming? I did, uh, but before, well, I was in late 61 and, uh, I went to work for Warner Machine Products. You know where Duffy's is at? Up here on 8th Street. It's up here on, uh, right up here, this plant, right up here on the uh, West 8th Street there, Duffy's uh, Stampin' Plant. Okay, I think I do know what you're talking about. That used to be Warner Machine Products. We made nothing but water pumps for cars. I went to work there in uh, early 62. When did you get hired on at Warner Gear? Now, was that separate from Warner Gear? Was it yeah, like it was uh, totally separate. Okay. Well, in in April of '62, I got drafted into the army, and that's when the uh, Berlin crisis was popping up. So I went and went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Did my eight weeks of boot camp. Went to Camp Gordon, Georgia, and did another sixteen weeks of of uh, AIT, advanced training. Uh, went to Hawaii, or well, tra- uh, transferred to Hawaii, to Schofield Barracks. And then was TDY, which is temporary duty to uh, Thailand and, and Cambodia, uh, Laos. Uh, we trained the uh, Thais and the Laotians uh, on how to use basically use our weapons and how to set ambushes and, and how to deal with certain aspects of the what was fixing to happen in Vietnam. Now, you were one of the first first guys in Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah. We were advisors, that's what they called us. Now, we've heard some people talk about working at Borg Warner as being somewhat regimented like the military since you have a little military experience how can you describe your time working at Borg Warner or compare your time uh, working at Borg Warner with that in the army was the same kind of hierarchy and just curious Uh, personally to me it was there's no there was no connection or not even being anywhere close to being the same because we lived uh, with the Laotian people we lived with the Thai people, and basically we eat what they eat. We we live with them. We trained them, and and that had surely had nothing to do with my experience at Borg Warner because that was a rough life. It was it was an extremely rough life. We would uh, travel from uh, Laos to. Uh, Vietnam to the uh, DMZ and uh, set up ambushes for the uh, Laotians and stuff like uh, of, that, of that nature. So it was a really a hard two years. It wasn't anything easy about it. So was it 64 that you got back to the States and you started? 64, I got uh, transferred to Fort Benjamin Harrison. When did you start working at Warner Gear full time? I started in Warner Gear in 1974. I stayed here at uh, at uh, Warner uh, Warner uh, Warner, uh, Warner Machine for ten years, and then I I, uh, I had, in the meantime I had taken uh, training to uh, become a uh, skilled tradesman, and I hired in at Borg Warner or Warner Gear in 1974 as a skilled trade machine repairman. 
Was uh, Warner Machine a union shop? Yes. Okay. Was uh, is there any any sort of comparisons that you can draw between the union at uh, at Warner Machine and War versus union at Warner Gear? Was one stronger than the other? Was one more active? More active. Uh, there was a lot of difference between the two unions, uh, the one at Borg Warner and the, or Warner Gear and the one at Warner Machine. Uh, uh, Warner Gear uh, Local 287 was an active union. It was extremely active. We went to uh, other factories that had strikes and we would uh, walk the picket lines with them. We would support other other. Uh, unions that were involved in strikes and uh, and uh, we did a lot of things. We had a we had a tremendous setup with local 287 that uh, even some UAW uh, shops never thought of having something like that. So, the union itself was active. Were you active within the union? Yes. What kind of jobs did you hold? I was a machine repairman. That was a skilled trades job. I repaired the machinery uh, throughout the plant. What, is, what it is, is you attend Ivy Tech or uh, some school and you, you get a journeyman's card. You're a journeyman repairman or a millwright or a machine repairman, such things as that. But I was a journeyman machine repairman. Since you, you seem to have quite an interesting early, uh, you know, y younger days. Yeah, I did. You moved around quite a bit. You had a few different jobs. Um, this question may be good for you. Uh, you know, what were some of the good and bad things about working at Board Warner? I guess also you can relate those to your previous experiences. Uh, maybe some, you know, working at Board was better than doing so, you know, something else that well, the good thing about working at Warner Gear was that uh, once you got your seniority in, you could almost be assured that uh, you would retire from there. Unless you just made such blunders uh, uh, with your job or you had an absentee problem or uh, some type of drug or an alcohol problem, you could be assured that you were probably going to you know, get your 30 years in and retire from there with a good pension and the health benefits and uh, and a retirement. While, while uh, at Borg Warner, did you ever experience uh, layoffs? No, I was never laid off one day. It's kind of rare, isn't it? Not for skilled trades, it wasn't. Can you, can you explain maybe a little bit more? Um, there seems to be, uh, you know, not only in terms of seniority, a hierarchy, but there are different areas within the plant, whether it's... Uh, you know, uh, testing or uh, experimental type stuff. I know we just talked to someone who did that. You got skilled trades who, who you know, repair the machines, labor who might sweep the floor, other people who might run the machines. Can you, can you explain kind of the differences in jobs and, and kind of how you all interacted or if you did interact? Well, the difference in some of the job classifications, for my, mine, for instance, was a separate classification. Machine repairman, uh, that was a second separate classification which you could not come into. You had to be a journeyman repairman to come into that. And uh, and that was the way with uh, most all of the skilled trades. Uh, the uh, labor department uh, or the uh, tool and gauge uh, uh, job like that, where they were all were classif classification jobs but seniority could take you out of there. Whereas with the uh, skilled trades jobs, uh, seniority could not take you out. You, the, the only thing your seniority guaranteed you was your shift, the shift that you could work. You know, If you had enough seniority, you could work days. If you didn't, somebody could bump you back to the midnight shift or afternoon shift. Did you have much interaction with other, with other groups of folks? It sounds like your job you know, anyone who worked on a machine might have might have come into contact with you, but but generally, did people get in a little bubble around their machines? And just a few guys that they worked with every day, or was there a lot of interaction within the plant between workers? Normally, I was assigned to a. Uh, the first few years, I had a lot of interaction with different people throughout the shop. 
I, I worked all over the plant. I worked on the assembly line. I worked in the grinding department. I worked uh, in the gear cutting department. Uh, I worked in the experimental department, uh, repairing the machinery and uh, and that and and that sort of thing. But as time went by, I started uh, uh, going out purchasing machine for the company. I would go. Uh, well, I went to Germany twice and bought machinery for the company. And I try and I went to just about all the states in the union purchasing machines and checking machines to be sure that that's what we wanted for Borg Warner to run their parts on. And we always tried to keep we always tried to buy the machines that were equal. They're almost the same if if this Ingersoll over here had a cert, had certain parts on it, such as filters, uh, drives, uh, electronic uh, drives, and that sort of thing, we tried to buy another machine that had that same drive and same transfer, uh, same uh, filters and uh, motors, uh, that sort of thing on it. So we always had parts for these machines. We always tried to buy the equal a machine that used the equal parts. Do you think that you were sent out on these trips because you, you were more worldly than, than a lot of your colleagues? Or uh, did you just fall into it? No, I was, uh, a lot, most of the machinery I was trained on. Uh, the Ingersolls, for instance, we got those in uh, Munich, Germany. And uh, uh, the uh, Ingersoll people came over here and uh, trained, uh, well, I was trained on them before we ever purchased any of them. And then after we were trained on them, we went to Germany to uh, to check them out further, and uh, I think we bought uh, like 40 machines. They were a million dollars a piece. It was about $40 million worth of machines we bought over there. And that didn't include the brooches and the, uh, and the uh, knicker machines and stuff like that. We purchased a lot of machinery in Germany. We were all over Germany for, I, th I stayed there the first time three months. Uh, stayed there the second time about two months, I'd say. I'd like to turn now, if we can, to to your activities within the union. Uh, what what did the union mean to you personally? Uh, the union meant to me, uh, personally to me, it meant everything to me. It, uh, I had no desire to be a company person, so I put all my uh, knowledge and experience that I had I, 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 with, within the union. I attended the meetings, I studied the Constitution, the bylaws. Uh, if they was, if they needed someone to go somewhere and, and, uh, and pick it, to help picketers or something like that, I always volunteered to go do that. And uh, I wanted to be involved in the union. It was something that was, it, actually it was something to make you proud of to be a member of the union. Do you think, um, do you think the younger guys felt that way? Uh, or was there a change over time in terms of who was involved? Or... I don't think the younger people feel the same way about the union now that we felt in the 70s and the 80s and the early part of the 90s. I think a lot of things has changed for young people as far as the union is concerned because most of them, I don't think they believe uh, in, in, in belonging to a, an organization. In the 70s, that was, that's something that you, you believed in and it's something you participated in and you ran for jobs within the local and, and if you were lucky enough to be elected, it was a, it was a, it was something to be proud of. You know, it's probably something like uh, you getting a, you getting a, 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 a transfer up to a, to a better job. It didn't pay any better, but it, it was just the idea that you, you were a leader in the, uh, you were an officer in the union, and you had certain responsibilities. And you look forward to those. How, 
how do you view the effectiveness of the union in representing your interests? Uh, now, you, you retired in 2004, is that right? That's correct. I retired in 2004, uh, September 2004. How, how did you view the effectiveness of the union in representing your interests? Uh, and if there is any comparison or, di or difference over time, um, was it better when you first got in there? The same? It, it, it was better in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, uh, the representation in the 70s, uh, you couldn't ask for any better representation. And in the 80s, and uh, 89, uh, I'd say the year 1989 was when the change came about in as far as the union. That was the year of a big strike, wasn't it? Yes, we struck uh, uh, for eight weeks over health care. A lot of people always thought we struck over money. We never did. All the years I was there, we never struck once over money. All the, all the people in town always put in the newspapers and things that, well, Local 287 has struck again. They must need more money and that sort of thing. But we never struck for the money, not even once. How we, did people in town uh, view you guys? What was the impression you got when you were out and about and you said you worked at Borg Warner? Uh, not good. Uh, the people in town, it seemed like they were totally against uh, the union and the workers making as much as what we did. And uh, if something went wrong, then it was naturally our fault. If we struck, the plant for any reason, I'll give you for an instance. We struck in uh, 1989 was one of the years I remember. We struck several times, but in 1989 we struck, and within four weeks of the strike, the United Way and Muncie was criticizing the union because their funds were being uh, shortened because we were on strike. And they seemed to blame us for being on strike when, truthfully, the company wanted a strike in 1989. We could have settled with them long before we went out, but they didn't want to settle. You could always tell when the company wanted a strike because they, they did not try to negotiate with you. And if they didn't try to negotiate with you, you knew that they were wanting a six or eight week strike for whatever reason, for inventory purposes or payroll purposes or whatever reason it was, you could always tell when they wanted a strike and they wanted one in 89. How would you, how would you characterize the relationship between labor and management in your time out there? It was good up until, uh, up until 89. After 89, it was not, not good. Uh, prior to 89, we had local people. Our relationship with, the, with, uh, with Warner Machine was good up until that point because we had local people that were in higher management positions. Uh, for instance, our uh, vice president of labor relations was Dean Boyle. He lived right here in Muncie. Kenny Stonebroker lived here in Muncie. So those were the people that we were dealing with when we went to when we sat down to negotiate a, a contract. They knew what they could afford to give, and we knew what they could afford to give, and we knew what we could afford to take from them. So, you know, it wasn't no secret. Did uh, did the union? You know, you you say that the community sometimes seemed to not understand what you guys were were really fighting for. What uh, what kind of things did the union do to help out the community? You mentioned the, the United Way. Uh, what were some of the other things that, that now that now that Borg Warner is gone, the community is going to come to miss? Well, the thing I was always mostly most proud of that the union did for the community was you probably don't remember when we had a, a children's home on Highway 32 out here. It was an old uh, three-story building they housed the uh, orphan children in. Uh, each Christmas, uh, during the year, we, we uh, got enough money together to uh, spend 
$150 on each child that was in the uh, orphan's home. Uh, and Christmas Eve, uh, they would open uh, uh, a local department store and we would take the children Christmas shopping and uh, buy them coats, shoes, things that they didn't have. And also we were allowed to take the child home with us for Christmases, and which I did several times, which was, that was nice. It was really, really made you uh, feel good. And we did that over for many years. We did that year after year after year. And then we bought them a bus. The union bought the orphans home a bus so they could transfer the kids to, to different things, you know, to, uh, so they could enjoy a few things. Did the company itself um, also do things within the community that might be missed? The company donated to the uh, United Fund. They usually matched what we met, what we had, what we put in. But as far as with the orphans home and stuff like that, they they didn't do that. So the company would would you say the company wasn't as active in the community as say that the the union was? No, they were not. Certainly not. They were not as active in uh, in uh, Muncie as what the union was. We would. Uh, uh, if someone was in uh, dire straits, uh, such as uh, uh, their rent was due, uh, they couldn't pay their rent, their groceries, they couldn't buy their groceries, uh, a child may be in Riley Hospital, uh, we would uh, get into our bill for and, to, uh, and what money we had in the union and we would give it to them in order for them to be, to get the help that they needed. Uh, we did we did that year after year after year, and I very seldom, if ever, did I see any union member uh, not open his wallet to help somebody. And and that that was a good part of the union too. When you retired in two thousand four, did you have already have the feeling? Uh, that the plant was going to close, or the plant was in trouble, and if so, why? When I retired in 2004, I knew in 1996 that the plant was going to close. A guy named uh, Tim Magnello and Pete Kohler came from somewhere. We never did really know where they came from. They claimed they were Borg Warner people. I, I had my doubts about them, but. It, uh, I guess it doesn't matter, but we had a, a uh, all employees meeting at the uh, upstairs at, uh, over the finance department, and these two guys came in and uh, introduced themselves and everything. We had never met them before, and uh, it turned out that they intended to uh, sell off half of the machinery and lay off half of the employees. And so, if you had any common sense at all, you knew that the end was coming, it was drawing close, because all we ended up with was one line, one uh, product, and that was transfer cases for Ford Motor Company. That was four-wheel drive transfer cases. And as you well know, the gasoline went up to $4. Uh, uh, People stopped buying uh, uh, four-wheel drive vehicles, so the business just kind of floundered. And we had about 19 li uh, product lines before they did that. We had a, a marine drive uh, uh, line that was the envy of the world. We had T19, T18. We made transfer. We made uh, transmissions for uh, Camaros, uh, six speeds, uh, electric shifts, uh, the uh, hot, uh, the hot uh, cars, you know, like Camaros and uh, Ford Mustangs. Uh, uh, the uh, T19 was a big truck transmission. T18 was a was a smaller truck transmission. We made uh, four speeds for Mustangs. Uh, Anything that had a, a four-speed to it, a Ford or a, a Mustang or a Camaro or any of the four-speed cars that younger guys drove, we made them. And these guys took us down to one uh, one product line. That's all we had. 
Was there a lot of a lot of pride among the workers? Oh yeah, All yeah, those sure. Lines and sure. things that you contributed to. What what did uh, taking away? All those product lines do to the kind of the feeling within the factory or the pride in one's job? Or... Well, when they took all of the product lines away, it naturally it, it hurt people because we lost about 800 employees off from that. And uh, like I said, if you had any common sense at all, you could you could look and see what was happening. So it did. Uh, it, it caused people to not be as prideful of their work and. Uh, and not be as easy to get along with as what uh, what uh, they had been in the past. We had a lot of trouble after 1996. What kind of trouble are you referring to? A lot of grievances, uh, a a lot of uh, uh, a, a company and, and union uh, anti uh, rhetoric. Uh, company put out notices that the union was trying to break the company, uh, that sort of thing. That just 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 nitpicking each other. Is there anything that you did uh, when you when you saw in 1996 uh, that the end was coming to kind of prepare yourself? Yeah. Yes. What did you do? Well, in '96, I start. I I seen. I believe I seen the end coming, but I didn't think it would be soon. So uh, we had uh, uh, always prepared ourselves, and uh, we had uh, taken out the uh, 401k, uh, you know, that sort of thing, and we saved in the credit union. And uh, the company, uh, we put a, if we put a dollar into the 401k, the company put 50 cents in, into it. So it, uh, some, some people uh, got quite a bit of money out of the 401 before the big bust happened, uh, you know. Did most people begin to prepare that you knew of? Um, no, a lot of people didn't prepare. They never, they never could accept the fact that the plant would close. Some people never accepted that fact. The day the plant closed, they didn't accept that fact. Why do you think that was? Because they didn't retire. They were guys that could have retired out of there that had up to 40, 45 years that stayed and lost everything. And they were warned, they were warned in, in December, November, December to get out because, you know, the company had already said, they had put out a notice that said, we're going to close the plant in April. And these guys kept hanging on. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, there was a reason why they did, but it certainly wasn't good enough. The uh, company intended to uh, buy out the uh, people's pension, insurance, that sort of thing. Well, the people that had over 30 years could have retired in December with a pension and insurance and everything, but they stayed longer than they should have, so they lost their uh, insurance for life. Their pension is doled out in so much each week. They got a payout they got a payout on a buyout, but they lost everything else. A lot of people that I knew, friends of mine that I had worked with, I, I personally told them, I said, you need to get out of there because you can. they've already told you they're closing the plant. And truthfully, a, a lot of it was just greed, I would say, because they, they were trying to get the buyout plus keep their retirement their pension and all the years of service. So, unfortunately, they got caught. So the the buyout to, to end the story, I suppose, the buyout was a lot less than than these guys expected. Is that is that fair to say? <sighs> the buyout that originally started was uh, forty six million dollars, and. The union uh, squabbled about it. And, uh, th they couldn't reach an agreement, so the company reduced it to $36 million. And that's when they had the meeting at, uh, at that Central High School and voted on the uh, uh, shutdown, uh, the uh, plant closing uh, uh, agreement. And uh, 
it, it was accepted. And that's what caught these, uh, these men that had a, a, a great number of years, that's what caught them. When the day they, they okayed that contract up at Central High School, those guys were caught because they couldn't get out then. Can you, can you describe that uh, the meeting at Central High School a little bit more? As, as I understand it, it was it's fairly contentious, and the, and, and the voting was done a little irregularly. So we had to move to a certain side. Was that it? Or? Well, I was a retiree, and I went to the meeting. Uh, the, the vote at Central was helped mostly for the people that worked, that were still actively working. If you were laid off or you was a retiree, you had to sit in a certain section of the room. Like in my case, I was retiree, so I sat on the north side, on the north side of the uh, of the, the room in the aisle there. And the people that were laid off, they had to sit in the same section I did because they didn't have a right. To, I didn't have a right to vote on it. If you were laid off for longer than a certain length of time, you didn't have a right to vote on it. So you just went because I just went because I wanted to hear what what was said and what they were going to do, so. This is definitely changing gears, but I wanted to touch on family. Um, was Borg Warner a good place? Did you have any kids? Yeah. Was Borg Warner a good place to, to raise, you know, good company uh, to raise a family? Uh, to oh, yeah. Uh, Borg Warner was probably one of the best places in Muncie to work at to raise a family. I am... I had two daughters. Uh, one of my daughters is gone now, but uh, I raised two daughters. I paid for my home. I bought, paid for my vehicles. I had a place up north at the lakes. So I paid for that. Uh, we had a good living. We made a good living off of uh, Warner Gear. Uh, I could never fault them for that. They, if you worked, they paid you good money. Can you, can you describe the significance of the closing of Warner Gear to you personally uh, and maybe how it's affected your family? Well, I, the closing of Borg Warner, it, I don't know how much it affected me. It, uh, I had been retired for several years, but I thought a lot about it. I thought about all the years that I'd been there and the people I had met, the jobs that I'd had in the union and, and out of the union. And I thought about a lot about what was gonna happen to the people that didn't, was gonna end up with nothing. And they were a lot of them, you know, and I guess it affected me more that way than it did anything. As far as those, uh, People packing up and leaving Muncie, that didn't affect me at all. I was glad to see them go. But I, I, I wasn't glad to see them go as far as the people were concerned. When I retired, the only ones I missed was the people I worked with. I didn't miss morning gear management. They were unscrupulous. Uh, very seldom ever told the truth. You couldn't trust them. Maybe they thought that about us. I don't know. But I've always been a person that if I told, if I gave you my word on something, I'd keep it. It, it was as good as anything that you could get. But when they would give you their word on something, it meant nothing. I mean, it just got to where it meant nothing. You couldn't depend on them keeping their word. It I could give you an example. In uh, 1977, I was a skilled trades committeeman. I had been elected to that job by the skilled tradesmen in all of the uh, trades. So we negotiated a contract with the company. I think it took us, I think about 30 days, we stayed in the motel out on, on Broadway. And uh, the company, uh, in the end, they promised us a transaxle job that went on a Ford uh, car if we would agree to the contract that they had proposed. We agreed to it, 
uh, along with uh, other different other changes in the company's uh, uh, rules and regulations and and the things that they wanted to change. But in truth, they didn't have that trans transactional job, and they never did have it. So were they really just out and out lied to us is what they did. And they, uh, of course, you've got to expect that when you're negotiating with somebody to tell, they may not tell you quite the truth, but I mean, to uh, have you to agree to, to a contract with them based on the fact that they have a transactional, transactional job that was going to put back to work six or 700 people, that was, that was a lot. And they never had that. They just... They just lied about it. One well, one thing that we that we heard about it's interesting you bring that up is at the end um, or toward the end, uh, Manganello asked, "Was it was it uh, President of the Union at the time French to head out and and to property tax abatements to to lobby the whoever was in charge of ta property tax abatements to uh, to uh, you know speak on behalf of the company to request these abatements." And that was the abatements were being taken away because because the jobs that, that the board Warner had promised hadn't hadn't been delivered. Do you know anything about that story? Can you can you fill? Yeah, us I uh, you, you're talking about the tax abatements that the company collected for for many a years that they wasn't entitled to. And we, I'm speaking of myself and another uh, a group of people, went to the city council and asked them to take away the abatements because they were being abused. The tax abatement was supposed to be used to train people and to buy equipment to provide jobs for other people. That's not what they did. They put the money into other plants and they then they uh, they just wasted it. So we asked the city council and they withdrew the, the abatement. So that took away several million dollars in tax abatements for them. That was one thing that were they were better about. So you were actually out there and a part of that. Yes. Yes. I probably was a part of just about everything that happened during the 30 years I was out there. I was I was a union official for five years, six years. I was always an alternate or a... Uh, I was always involved in the union. So I always knew what what I should do and what was going on. Did you feel that by asking, uh, what was it, the city council? To yes. To take away the, pro the, the tax abatement that uh, you were pushing the company too hard? No, because I don't think the abatement would, uh, would have made any difference whether they stayed or went. The company, the, the company was better uh, mostly because they had to deal with the union. See, we were the only union shop in Bull Warner, and uh, they didn't like to deal with the union. They liked to do things to what they said was that's the way it was going to be. And when you got a union, you've got to deal with it. You've got you, uh, arbitrations uh, that you've got to go through. You've got contract negotiations you've got to go through. You've got health agreements. You've got insurance, you get, you got everything that you got to deal with. And they didn't like that. In my opinion, that's one of the reasons they left because they didn't want to deal with the union. And I've, and I've had people in management tell me that was the reason. What do you, uh, what do you think the future of unionism in the United States is? Do you think it'll survive? I think it'll survive, but I think it'll be different than what it is it had been in the past. In the past, it was automotive, UAW, United Automobile Workers of America. Now it's going to be, I think, dealers in Las Vegas, uh, sheriff's deputies, uh, uh, merchandise, uh, people to handle merchandise in department stores, maybe Walmart. I think they'll, they'll unionize Walmart someday. But at the automotive, the union, as far as the automotive industry, industry yeah, I think it's finished. And it may, the union, and the union may be finished as far as the young people are concerned because I don't see, I don't see young people stepping up. I don't see nobody stepping up, taking the place 
of, of union, of the people in the union. You know, it, uh, right here in Muncie, I, I, I couldn't tell you anybody that's, that's in the union. I don't know of anybody that's, that's a union official. I used to, I knew all of them because we would meet and have uh, discussions on what was going on and uh, what we should do and stuff like that. But right now, I can't tell you one person I know in this town. We've been assigned the retirees. Uh, that's I'm the vice chairman of the retirees. Right now, we're assigned to the road deputies at uh, the Delaware County Sheriff Department because they're UAW members. See, we were always, for ever since the 50s, we were uh, local 287 retirees. That's what we still call ourselves because it's all those years. But now we've got to, everything that comes through the UAW goes through the, the uh, road deputies, uh, local. And if we need uh, if we need to spend money out of our funds, we we got to go through those that local there. But I, I said I didn't know of anybody that was a, a union official. I do. Uh, those guys are UAW members. The road deputies, uh, the police are not. The firemen have their own union, but those are the basically the only ones I know that are still UAW members. Kind of a broad question here toward the end. How do you feel that the, the closing of Board Warner affects Muncie? What are the long-term effects, short-term effects? I believe that the closing of Board Warner probably was just about put the finishing touches on Muncie because we had lost so many uh, automotive uh, uh, plants. Uh, the uh, Delco Battery, Delco Remy, uh, Chevrolet Muncie, uh, I can name you off, 25 plants that we have lost out of this town. And this out here was the last big plant. And as you can see and see in the paper every day, uh, the trouble they're having with their budget, they can't, they can't make their budget. They, uh, there's never gonna be enough money now from now on to, uh, there's no money coming in. Or Borg Warner or Warner Gear might have paid millions per year, you know. Now they don't pay anything. Yorktown over here is gonna be hurting. They collected a lot of uh, a lot of money off of uh, Warner Gear. Do you see any hope for the future of Muncie? Any, any kind of? No, I see none whatsoever. No future at all for, for Muncie. Uh, They've even laid the firemen off, you know. They've reduced the fire department. When you when you get to the point where you're reducing safety, then you 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 can almost pretty well say that you're at you're at the bottom of it, you know. You're you're done. I I think Muncie will just float along and uh well, like uh, California, they're almost bankrupt. I think that'll happen to Muncie before it's over because they can't raise taxes too much more. There are people in Muncie that don't have the money to pay them, where there are no jobs. So if you were a young kid uh, growing up in Muncie now, graduating from a Muncie high school, what would be the first thing you would do? If I was a young kid graduating from uh, high school, uh, I, uh, the first thing I'd do is take that trip I did when I was, when I was 20 i take that first, and then I would come back and join the Air Force. The Air Force has great benefits. They have a tremendous uh, training for your future, you know, and uh, you always got a good, a good place to uh, sleep, a good meal, and they pay good, and they have good medical. Those are the medical part is not something you probably ever get again at a job. I've got a grandson that I adopted when he was five years old. I put him, he, he graduated from high school, had, at, he, he graduated pretty well at the top. He's a cook at, uh, at a local restaurant, 
It's all they can find. And that, you know, and there's a lot of kids that graduated that can't even find that. And then, what, well, Ball State's the, uh, the uh, biggest employer in Muncie? That's that's really that's really uh, to me that's the telling point right there when a when a university it, it, you're dependent on a university to be the biggest employer in Muncie, but yet the university doesn't pay any taxes, you know. And if you don't have, I think, automotive, and you don't have a place for these young guys to go to work and earn a good living and buy a home buy a car, raise a family, then you're not gonna have a town. That's, that's just my opinion. At this point, I've, we've exhausted all my questions, but I'd like to give you an opportunity now to, to say anything you'd like to about Borg Warner, uh, about your time there that we haven't hit already. Well, I, I appreciate uh, Warner Gear uh, uh, employing me in nineteen in the seventies. Uh, like I said, they they helped, they raised my family uh, and provided uh, uh, a good living for me. But what I don't like about Borg Warner now that you we're talking about two different th places. When I heard it, it was it was Warner Gear. When it went to Borg Warner. That's when a lot of the problem started. But right now, uh, Warner Gear or Borg Warner has sued the retirees trying to take our health benefits away from. And those were guaranteed health benefits. They were negotiated into the contract. It was a promise from the company that when you, if you would work 30 years, we'll give you a pension. We'll provide health care for you until you die. And then if you do, if your wife is still alive, we'll provide that health care for her. Well, they're breaking their neck, getting to the federal court, trying to change that, you know, trying to say that's not true, that we didn't say that. It's not in the contract. It is in the contract. And just today we got a letter from from the uh, UAW for uh, the, uh, the case has been transferred to Michigan, which we wanted it to be. We didn't want it to be in Indianapolis because of the Indianapolis is mostly a Republican federal court. Michigan is mostly a Democrat federal court and we get better breaks from the Democrat federal judges than we do the Republican judges. But we shouldn't be in that position because they violated their word. We've had a real hard time and since 19, 2006 whenever they deleted, changed our prescriptions. And then after we won that case, then they turned around and sued us, saying we didn't have lifetime benefits. So that's where we're at now in court. So I don't have any use for Borg Warner. I think they're all, uh, well, the words I would use was Probably not something you could show on uh, your uh, network. So I'll just leave it at that. They're not trustworthy. Uh, they're lying uh, people that uh, are out for themselves, and that's that's that would be my opinion of. Thank you very much for your time today, Mr. Howard. Thank you, sir.